All right, welcome to the show. I'm Jason Whitlock. Colin Cowherd is out today on vacation, so I'm joined today by four-time Pro Bowler Michael Vick and a couple of Super Bowl champions, Mark Stink Schlereff and Eric Davis. Let's start in Dallas. They call him Stink. All right, where reportedly Ezekiel Elliott was involved in an incident at a bar last night with one witness alleging Zeke punched a man who got into a verbal altercation with a woman in Zeke's party. The people so far, the police so far, have not confirmed that Zeke was involved in the incident, but Zeke has a history of questionable decision-making, drawing attention by visiting a marijuana dispensary in Seattle and pulling down a woman's top at a St. Paddy's Day par parade. <laughs> I don't know what I think about those two. And he's currently under investigation for an alleged domestic assault in 2016. I think the Cowboys should be concerned about Zeke's pattern of misbehavior. And again, I, I, I want to beat up on Zeke, but I want to say that I understand young people with this money and fame. There's no way to be prepared for this. The man's father, before the draft or early, before the last season, or early in last season, my biggest worry is, I don't believe my son knows how to navigate in life being a superstar. He's like a little boy who wants to play football and have fun and enjoy people. We've always said this about Ezekiel. Ever since he came in the world, he's just happy to be alive. He's a happy guy, but this world is not. This is an issue I always had when I was young. I played too rough and I was a bit too silly. And I've made some mistakes in my career, particularly early in my career. Obviously, Zeke's involved in some serious things, domestic violence, uh, now beating up someone in a bar, allegedly. Some of the other things, smaller, the, the marijuana dispensary. But if I'm the Cowboys, I'm concerned. Absolutely. We, we need to get Zeke in a year-round training camp, a year-round uh, some sort of life coach, uh, always on call type of... Uh, you know, some type of canceling or something, man. It, it's, it's not good right now for Zeke to be going through this. Uh, he has a bright future in front of him, and it's just sad to see uh, him going through things like this. I really feel like the people around him are responsible. And, of course, Zeke has to make his own decisions and his own choices. But at the, day, at the end of the day, it's people around him that has to help him make these choices. And we heard what his dad said. I mean... You know, I may give him a call sometime this afternoon, you know, because I really don't want him to blow everything he has in front of him. You, you got to be responsible. I mean, you know coming into it that it's a social media driven world. You know everybody's got a cell phone on their, or their, their cell phone has a camera on it. You know you're always going to be scrutinized and looked at. Here, here's the thing that's unfair, and we all know that life's not fair. The thing that is unfair is that a kid comes into this kind of money, and all of a sudden, you know what we expect him to do? to operate with our standards, with our belief system, yeah. with our moral code. A kid walks in there, a guy came from Fish Billy White in Alaska, right? I came from an upper, you know, upper middle class yeah. family, and I was taught some values and how to manage some money and taught, well, a lot of people aren't. A lot of people don't have that advantage. And now all of a sudden they come into it and you're like, you know what you need to do, right? And you're like, wait a minute, whoa, 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 whoa. Don't put your moral compass on that kid who's never had that, that may not have ever had that kind of training. Now, with that said, it's his responsibility to grow up. I mean, at some point, all of us have to grow up, right? At some point, all of us have to take responsibility. I'm proud of you, because what you were into, to me, I can't even fathom that, man. Yeah. But you know what you've done? You've owned it. And at some uh, point, you have to own it, and you have to say, this is me, I'm flawed, I've got some issues, but I'm working to get better. Yeah. And, and so all of us, I mean, every single one of us has done some things that I thank the Lord that that stuff ain't on some social media platform <laughs> right now. Yeah. Some yeah. of the things that, that <laughs> I've done, but, so. But you know what, but everyone's missing a point right here. The question is, should the Cowboys be concerned about Ezekiel sure. Elliott and, and yes. his information? Now, what everyone's missing is that the Cowboys have never been concerned about guys. Oh, that's not true, the field. Oh, hold, hold on, hold on, hold on, guys, stop this, stop this. Jerry Jones has, he's concerned if you're missing time. 
I was I was in San Francisco and I heard about yeah. the White House. Okay. Forty nine ers logo on. over hold, his hold head. On. As he hold on. Hold on. No. 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 I was in I was in San Francisco and I knew what was happening at the White House in Dallas. You mean to tell me Jerry Jones didn't? Jerry Jones has never been concerned about what the guys are doing off the field. You were talking about him. At the, sure. Ezekiel, as a person, has to grow up. He has to take care of himself. He has he he has to he has to own what right. who if he is, what he's doing. Why did he hire all those people to babysit Des Bryant? The same thing Mike's talking about. Maybe Ezekiel needs that kind of help. But I think it I, I, you know yeah. what? Yeah, I, yeah, I, that's I, also I, if he if he okay that one individual. Okay, that that one individual, and, when, and he did those things, and and I, I get what I get what you're saying, and I know it sounds like I'm trying to straddle the fence, but you pick out this one player, and you know all these other things are going on. So why why is Ezekiel right here now? Why doesn't he already have those babysitters around him? Because he's not, that's not his issue. If you're not missing time, and he was worried about he was Des worried Bryant. about Des Bryant missing time. If he's not missing time, if he's going to be able to show up, if he's not getting suspended. Jerry's not concerned because these are grown men you're dealing with. Uh, well, he's concerned for the reasons you're talking about. Dez is already potentially getting suspended before this incident this season. So there is a time concern. Ezekiel Elliott, I'm sorry. Yeah. There is a time yeah. concern there. And so I, I also just... Coaches can't be all-knowing. Organizations can't be all-knowing and pervasive everywhere a player is. Ezekiel Elliott, I think, actually comes from a decent family. This guy is a bit immature, and his father recognizes it. And to me, again, the re I'm not defending the guy, but I've been young and dumb, and I came from very good parents that instilled very good values in me. But you can get caught in the wrong situation, yeah, and if yeah, you, yeah. you mix alcohol in that situation, that's how mistakes happen. Yeah, well, there's no question about that. All those things being true. You've got to own it. You've got to take responsibility. To your point, though, you know, if the organization doesn't hold you to a standard or if there's a back staircase up to the owner's office that you can say, hey, listen, man, this is what's going on, then that's a bad, that structurally, that organization will always have a few cracks in it. There will always yes, be some yes. issues within the organizational structure if you feel like you can circumvent or emasculate the head coach and walk straight up to the owner's office and say, I don't like the way we're doing this and have the DC owner yeah. have a, you know, have the owner have that kind of so Former that red skin, but decent. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but but I think all, all I think all these things are on the Cowboys, man. I, yeah. My biggest concern if I was in that organization is that, and we've all been here, you can have a few guys in your locker room. Every guy, every locker room has five or six touch guys, right? There's five yeah. or six guys that are flat out crazy uh, or close to if it. If you're a good team. Right, if you're a good team. So my big concern is what kind of influence does that, and I'm not saying, I'm not saying Zeke is a touch guy. I'm just saying what kind of influence could you have on a Dak Prescott? Possibly, you know, possibly getting Dak Prescott to to roll out with you I'm when thinking of those Dak those concerns. Yeah, yeah, I, I, that's, that's, yeah. What that's I, the hope. That's yeah, what yeah. I hope. But I also know this: the the five or six touch guys. If you don't have a locker room full of professionals, they have a there's a gravitational pull there that is stronger than all the professional guys on your team. And I don't know why that is. No, it's Maybe it's, like it's because crazy. we're children. Ball players <laughs> like crazy. It's got to be crazy to play <laughs> football right. in the first place, all right? All right. Let's move to Colin Kaepernick, who took some criticism from Joe Montana last week, but is now earning some praise from another 49ers legend, Steve Young. Young says he is surprised that Kaepernick is still unsigned and that the quarterback is, quote, a good player that wants to play and is not toxic in the locker room. All kinds of people are saying Kaepernick wants to play, but I'm still waiting to hear it from Colin Kaepernick. That's my issue with Colin Kaepernick. Mike, you went through a situation where, for lack of a better word, toxic, coming out of prison, a lot of controversy around you because of the dog fighting deal. Tony Dungy wrapped his arms around you and helped get you back into the NFL. That's what I want to see from Colin Kaepernick, a football person, him get involved with, and I think he needs to actually talk and put his name on what he feels about the NFL and wanting to play. I think he needs to speak for himself. I think he really does. The first thing we got to get Colin to do is cut his hair. You know, I mean, <laughs> listen, I'm not up here to try to be politically correct, but, you know, even if he 
puts cornrows in it. I, I don't think he should represent himself, you know, in that way in terms of, you know, just the hairstyle. Just go clean cut. You know, why not? You know, you're already dealing with a lot, a lot of controversy surrounding this issue. Um, That's a and fascinating thing to hear you say, Mike. That, that he needs to do is, you know, just try to be presentable. I mean, look, so all the social media stuff that he's doing, look, we, we get it, we understand it. it. It's time for, you know, Collins to step up in a different way. And, you know, I think primarily the reason why he's not signed to a team right now is because of the last two seasons and, and not being as productive as everybody you know, Let me just ask you a question, because I, I kind of chuckled when you said he had cut his hair, because I just thought you didn't like the hairstyle. But you're actually, uh -oh. you're actually saying that it represents think, something. Yeah, I just think perception and image is everything. And listen, it's not the Colin Kaepernick that we know, we've known, you know, since he entered the National Football League. And I'm just going off my personal experiences. But listen, I love the guy to death, you know. But I want him to also succeed on and off the field, and this has to be a start for him. I, I get where you're going about the look. One of the most militant looks uh, to corporate America is a black man with cornrows and a goatee. Yeah. It, you know, so I, I, I get, I, I know what you mean right there, but I don't think I it's going to make a difference. Image. But, you know, but it you don't know, make a difference. That, it has nothing to do that, with that's football. That's what I'm saying. Anything so anything. I don't think he needs to cut his hair. I don't think any of it's going to make a difference. I don't think him coming out and saying, I want to play football, and I know you've said that a lot, with him coming out and saying, I want yeah. to play, it's not going to change. Because if Colin Kaepernick comes out right now and sits, and if I get up out of this seat and he comes sit in right now and says, I want to play football in front of this camera. It's not going to happen. It's, it's not going to change the perception of the people that, are, that have to employ him. They I, feel I a certain way about him right now. See, I, but I look, at, I look at that, first off, I think he's an articulate kid. I think he's a smart kid. And I think he could sit down here and at least open up the dialogue to where you could see that, hey man, he's not going to be divisive in a locker room. He's not going to be militant. He's not going to be I these things. Never heard of him being divisive. No, what, yeah, there, there's gone. plenty, of, there's plenty of guys that kneeled during the national anthem in, in a, a sign of solidarity. They all have jobs because you know the, the establishment. One, he's a quarterback, right? And and the establishment, you know, if if you can play or if they think you can play, my biggest thing about his style of play is I think he's gotten into a situation here with the style of play where he wasn't productive in a traditional drop back yeah, system. Correct. And so now yeah. we're looking at it like if I'm an owner or if I'm a coach, do I want to employ my starting quarterback in my starting offensive system and have a separate system for a guy who runs that? Omar, Omar, hold for one second, hold for okay. one second. We're, we're getting way too far away from the most interesting thing they've said here. We got Michael Vick here who had to struggle getting back into the NFL. Y you had an image problem. Yeah. And you were a guy that wore cornrows, wore the gold chains, played the whole hip hop had an image. Afro at times, even during the tough times, you know, it was something that people was would whisper in my ear. You know, this is the way you're being perceived. But that wasn't me as a person. You know, I understand Colin. You know, he's a great kid. Yeah, he is. He is yeah. a great kid. And the reason he's not playing it has nothing to do with. You know, the national anthem, I think, is more solely on this play. But, yeah, I mean, everything takes precedent, you know, in terms of image, perception. You know, you got to clean it up. You got to make sure you do it all right. I can see people's heads exploding over social media right now. Michael Vick says Colin Kaepernick needs to, co to cut. Truth. Thank you. I'm always be honest. Th and give the man the advice he yeah. needs to go back and get this money. Because that's what I would money. tell Colin if we were sitting face to face and, you know, he wanted some advice from me or if he asked me what do I, what do I think. That's what, those are the words that may come out of my mouth in a different sense. What would you say to people, oh, so he's got to sell out to get back in the NFL. He can't keep oh, it real. It's, it's not about selling out. When you're good and you're playing great, then you're going to be wanted. People are going to want to, you know, sign you. They're going to want to see you play. They want to see everything that you have to give, you know, in, in regards to him just not being signed right now. It, it has to do with the production over the last couple of years, and I continue to say that. I want to... Go back and hammer this, though. People were whispering in your ear that you needed to change your appearance when Absolutely. you were... And you wouldn't hear them at that time? I didn't listen until the end, until I was going through the turmoil and the hardships, and it was mm -hmm. very difficult. And then I started to see what was most important, and that was, you know, cleaning up, you know, changing my image, not just for public perception, but for the judge and what, what you know, everything that I was, you know, about to, you know, get involved in. So. You know, it was a difficult process, 
and it was one that I didn't like, but it was one that I had to accept. And if, if you look at yourself now, you look at Michael Vick back when he came in, compared to, to what you've been through and where you are now, what, what, like, what would you say to that kid? My decision making is different. And that's the part that I always wanted to work on in, in terms of bettering myself as a person. I knew at the end of the day, I can go 23 hours out the day and make all the right decisions. And then in the last hour, I can screw it up. And that's, those are things that, you know, as a young guy, you don't get, you don't understand. And in reference to Zeke and his situation, I love the kid so much and I appreciate what he do for the game of football. And I don't, I don't want to see him to continue to go through this. That's why I say he, he may need a life coach, somebody to be there on call to help him, you know, not have to go through these situations that's going to be detrimental to his career. All right, welcome back to the show. Michael Vick is still here and so is Eric Davis. We're joined now by Fox NBA analyst Chris Broussard. Let's move to Lonzo Ball who couldn't make up his mind this past week wearing four different shoe brands in his last four summer league games. This despite Lonzo having his own big baller brand shoes, which his father LeVar launched after a, the major shoe companies passed on his demand for a billion dollar deal. Lonzo and, Le and LeVar both talked about Lonzo's shoe choices this weekend. You insinuated to me yesterday that this is all part of a master plan. Are you trying to start a bidding war here? Uh, something like that. Something like that, okay? Lonzo wears whatever the hell he wants. I don't be like, son, wear the shoe, wear the shoe. Nah. If he feel like wearing a shoe, he gonna wear it. And that's the good thing, like I said, about freedom. Look at his feet. Who cares? Son, you can wear some slippers or some Gucci Louis Vuitton biscuit shoes out there, as long as you win. All right, I think Lonzo is trying to politely put some distance between him and his father and his father's controversy. I think it's a smart thing. I think it's a great look. I think he's expressing some independence and some confidence and it's showing up in his play. I, I, I think that if you look at his answer to Cassidy Hubbard there, he doesn't want to be involved with this. Something like that is just a dismissive, non-answer. The dude just wants to play ball. I couldn't imagine being 19, thinking about being in the NBA, and he's probably thinking about, man, I'm gonna wear some Kobe's, I'm gonna wear this, and then one day when I'm a big star, maybe I will have my own signature shoe brand. His father takes all that decision making out of his hands and tries to make it for him, uh, and I think he's backing up a little bit, putting the necessary space between that controversy so he can just play ball. I think it is a sign of independence. I, I don't know. I, I interviewed LeVar yesterday. He said they are open for business with Nike, Adidas, Under Armour, whoever, but the cost is $3 billion. <laughs> so he's wow. not backing up. He's not backing up. I don't know what the motivation is. You're right. Lonzo maybe gave us insight that his dad won't and said, yeah, something like that. And hopefully it does in that way, because this is getting kind of messy and sloppy. Whatever the case, I do think it's a good sign for Lonzo, because he's going to need to be independent to be the leader of the glamour franchise of the NBA. I just hope he finds a shoe that's comfortable. <laughs> you know, throughout <laughs> everything that he's going thing, through, this huh? is the most important thing. <laughs> Listen, Nike make great product, and, and so does Under Armour and Adidas, but... Personally, I would, you know, say sign with Nike or find some type of uh, deal that can, uh, you know, coexist with everything that he got going on outside of, you know, with his dad and, you know, all of the marketing. But I understand the strategy, you know, behind it. But it is getting a little messy. Um, he has to make a decision quick. I don't know how soon, uh, but he, he has to get something done. No, you know, see, that's just it. I think this is part of the family business. I'm listening to what everyone's saying. I think this is all strategy, what they're doing. Right now, all Under Armour, Nike, Adidas, they all made him a certain offer uh, before the draft. This is what we will pay you. Okay, now you've seen me come out in the triple doubles and you've seen these things. You've seen me play in my shoes. I got another bargaining chip right here. Let's reassess things. What's what's my value right now? Do, how how bad? How, how, do you want me in your shoes? Less. So, so he's he's put it out there. Yeah, less than what they offered dollars? him before. Yeah, no, 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 no. no, 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 no that's way. what I'm saying. He's, no way. He's saying it's not why. three billion. No, he's, he's, not close. he's putting himself out there. And and look, I have a product. Let's see. Do you really want me in your product? Because you see, I have one that I can wear already. That's what I think he's doing. And I think he's doing this with his, with his dad. I'm from the Midwest. So why is it less? I gotta hear. Yeah, this. I'm from the Midwest. Did y'all ever say selling wolf tickets? 
Wolf yeah. tickets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. what LeVar has been doing, selling Wolf tickets. In terms of, yeah, we're going to start our own brand. We're going to put out our own but shoe. if it raises the value, whoa, whoa, good. Whoa, 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 whoa. But when the son won't even wear the shoes, the Wolf tickets have Wait, been exposed as Wolf tickets. He don't even want to wear the shoe. But he did wear the shoe. He worn his shoe. He wore other shoes. And not since he's been playing better. He, so. he told... Well, <laughs> no, he did shoe. have a triple-double. Hold on. He had his first triple-double in the big baller. Brand. I don't think he so. Need to be no, 11-11. Yes, he did. The 11-11. I mean, he need to try to... He, he should be trying to promote the big baller brand shoe. I mean, at the end of the day, if that's what it's about, it, maybe it's not comfortable for him. Thank I don't you. know. Something's not right. If I'm taking Nike, too long. I'm laughing. You come talk big baller, your son won't even wear them. That's a t-shirt company. It's we do shoes over here. LeVar said yesterday in the interview that regardless, big baller brand sneakers will be out in November. He, he said, I said, look, if you go with Nike or somebody, will big baller brand die as far as the shoe business? He said, no, they're going to be out. And you'll so. be the only one wearing them <laughs> because you got them for free. You ain't gonna pay five hundred dollars for them. Mm. Again, I don't know. Ain't nobody is. buying them shoes, man. Nike and well, Adidas no. and Under Armour are giggling. <laughs> they he, laughing. It, 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 we'll see. We'll see. He needs them more than they need but him. But they're not going anywhere. That's the thing about it. If Lonzo, if Lonzo comes out and he plays the way expectations have him playing the guy will still be wanted by those companies. Me, they have nothing to lose. You know lose. who's going to sell more shoes than Lonzo, in my opinion? And it's not because he'll be a better player. He'll be a more exciting player. Dennis Smith Jr. He is the guy that's been he's electric in be, the he's summer. He's not going to be more... I mean, the way Lonzo plays is unique for today's NBA. What Dennis does, we see. Electric. It's a lower level of Westbrook. You know, it's... it's we saw Derrick Rose. We see these high scoring Damian point Lillard, guards. But I hear you. It's Damian Lillard. All right, to Floyd Mayweather and Conor McGregor, who wrapped up their four city press tour with another massive event in London on Friday. As expected, the whole week of events was full of fireworks, with both fighters taking the art of trash talk to a new level. He's in a tracksuit. He can't even afford a shoe anymore. Let me show you what a hundred million dollar fighter look like. Still got a hundred million, and then he never touched it. Dance with me, boy. Dance with me, son. He looks like a little break dancer or something. A little twelve year old break dancer carrying a school bag on stage. What are you doing with a school bag on stage? You can't even read. We already know this right here. He like to quit. One, two, three. DJ, turn the music on for the stripper. Yeah, yeah, ones. Cause that's all you work. Where's the real money at? Did they not know I'm half black? I'm half black from the belly button down. All right, not surprisingly, these comments provoke some controversy with the undefeated Mike Wise tweeting, quote, Floyd Mayweather went all anti-gay slur on Conor McGregor in London today. Someone shut them both down. They have no bottom. And Jay Adande, also from ESPN, responded to Wise's quote, this promotional tour has had the opposite effect on me. It's killed my desire to see or hear them anymore. Despite the backlash, <laughs> I think the tour was a big success. I'm friends with Mike Wise and Jay Adande. Some more wolf tickets being sold. They're gonna be watching the <laughs> well, fight. Well, they didn't say they're not gonna watch the fight. Jay A did say he he's said, more. I don't want to see or hear it right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> give, me, I, give me a month. I think the tour helped the fight. Some are arguing it hurt the fight. I'll tell you, this is definitely a flight I'm gonna watch. Thank you. I cannot wait to see it. There's been enough said on both sides and this is going to be a great one. I mean, I, I, I know it's going to be one-sided. I do know that. But 
as far as promotion, those guys are doing an outstanding job. Yeah, it, it helped. I just think it went on too long. The yeah. first one would have been enough. I mean, that was enough to you really get the second, us all. Third and fourth. Well, I had to for work, although I wasn't <laughs> <a little> interested. <laughs> but it, it just, I think it was a bad look for boxing. It was a bad look for each of those individuals because even though I'm going to watch the fight, part of me saying, I don't really want to pull for either one of these dudes. You know what I mean? And I think a lot of people are looking at it like that. Floyd didn't have the best image in the world. That kind of yeah. has continued. Connor, his image was pretty good, even though he was outspoken and braggadocious. Yeah. But I think he lost a lot of fans. So I think people are looking at this like, yeah, we're going to watch it to see what happens. But I don't think they like either either one of these guys. Yeah, as far as the tour, I think it definitely helped because, look, we're just sitting here talking about it. That's why you do this. That's why they have all of that promotion so that you get it all hyped up and you see how Mike is sitting here like, I'm definitely going to watch this. Yeah. Uh, now, as far as helping or hurting the individual fighters, if you were pro either guy, they're, they're probably still pro either guy. What, you, what these guys show is, you know, that there's some, there's some sides of them that the guys straddling the fence, I don't necessarily like. As you just said, Chris, you, you don't know if you want to cheer for either guy. You, people already had their feelings about Mayweather. They already had their feelings about McGregor. And if you didn't really do it, you just see that there's some ignorance coming out of both of them that you may not like. As far as it promoting the fight or saying, I'm not going to watch the fight because of what they just said or did, I don't think that's going to help. I, I don't think it's going to hurt it. It hurt their numbers that much. People are still going to watch it. They want to watch it. We got to be very quick here. But look, all this acting like, oh, they revealed something about themselves. No, they didn't. This is who I thought they were. But they that's what I'm saying. They didn't say well, we one. We don't have to see it. But it, It's right. like if we, know, if we know kids cheat on tests, do we just say, you know what? They cheating anyway. Let's just Chris, let them cheat. Chris, no, you try to stop. You don't allow to happen. After the show, I'm gonna be over at that candy ditch. No one's gonna be surprised, Chris. No, <laughs> I won't be revealing myself. <laughs> All right, welcome back to the show. Michael Vick, Mark Slayer, and Eric Davis are back. Let's move to Virginia, where it was just announced that Michael Vick will be inducted into the Virginia Tech Sports Hall of Fame, but not without some controversy. Paul Woody, a columnist for the Roanoke Times, writes that granting Vic the same honor as some of the school's most distinguished athletes and athletic administrators is an insult. All right, it's going to be tough with Mike sitting here. People may feel handcuffed about being honest, but I can say honestly, I completely disagree with the guy. And, and it's not, and I said this to Mike earlier when we were on the herd, not only does his athletic feats at Virginia Tech belong in the Hall of Fame, but his recovery from a tragic mistake and a bad mistake and the way he's handled himself in recovery from that incident and post-incarceration, he damn sure belongs in the Hall of Fame. That is more impressive than anything you ever did on the athletic field, just your evolutionary growth and what kind of symbol and role model that could be to some of the young athletes at Virginia Tech. So I, I, I'll change it up a bit. Do you know Paul Woody... Are you aware of people that, that think you don't belong in the Hall of Fame? What would you say to them? I don't know Paul Woody, but I think I'm going to invite him out to the ceremony. I save him a seat. I let him get a chance to, to get to know me and talk to me about any uh, problems or anything that he feels should be addressed, you know, in terms of why he said what he said. You know, I still have to pinch myself at times to uh, even realize that I'm, I'm a convicted felon. Look, I did what I did, and, you know, I've made some bad choices, you know, but I also made amends for that and worked, you know, tirelessly over the years uh, to make amends for what has been done. I feel like being a role model, you know, was uh, in that situation and trying to show the masses of kids that, listen, I made a mistake, but I'll, I can also come back from it uh, with the help of a lot of people, you know, who was very influential. Um, and that's teamwork, and I think the reason why uh, I'm being inducted into the Hall of Fame is because of, you know, the works post-incarceration. And uh, like I said, countless hours. Uh, didn't really have to do it, but I didn't do it for my, you know, not only for myself, I did it as an example and to represent, um, you know, any kid or any, you know, guy who may go through some turmoil and have to, you know, turn it all around. Yeah. I, I mean, I, you know what? The, the redemption story is good enough for me. Um, and every one of us, I mean, 
You know what would, would for you, obviously, when you were in college, you were a phenomenal athlete. You are a phenomenal athlete in the National Football League. The story is what the story is, and it was a heinous story. But the redemption part of it, to me, is the inspirational part. Yeah. It's the part that gives me hope in other people. It's the part that gives me hope that all of us, regardless of where we start, you know what, we can say, that's it. Man, I'm going to put my foot down, and I'm not going to go down this path any longer. And then that's up to you. What you want to do with that is up to you. And I understand people are like, well, you know, it shouldn't be, it shouldn't, you shouldn't be. And I understand people's points of view. I get that. You know, I get that people will be, there will be some that will be angry about that. But I think the redemption aspect of your story is far greater. It's it, the totality of the redemption is far greater than what happened. Yeah. And to me, again, I'll say it again, I, I'm proud of you. Thank you. I am proud of the way you've conducted your life from that point forward. And so good for you. And it can be, it can be a sign to everybody who looks at this story to say, you know what, I can change my life. I can turn my life around. And that to me is, is as powerful as you can be. That, that's the influence that you're going to have on generations of kids going forward that want to be Hokies. Well, the, the university has, has the choice to say, while someone wore our colors, this is what we thought of them. This is what they did. Um, and like any award, like, like always like contracts and everything, there are bridges over what you've done and what, you're, and what the expectations are. How, how high do you take that bridge? Um, looking at you, the difference between you and a lot of other guys, I went and looked at the list of the Hall of Famers at Virginia Tech. Now the difference between you and a lot of the other ones is that your mistakes we know about, Right. okay? How many other people on that list, and I started thinking about that, how many other people that, on, that are in the Hall of Fame right now that had some issues down the road, be it, be it whatever? And I'm not, I don't know, but, you know, were any of them abusive to their spouse? Were any of them, you know, druggies, did, you know, have drug problems? Did any, were any of them, you know, homophobic slurs or racial slurs or anything? I don't know. Yours are out there. Yeah. So the university has decided that we think what you've done deserves to be honored. That's enough for me, okay? I think that's all that matters. <laughs> I hope that Paul Woody takes you up on your invitation. I am definitely sending Paul an invite. And, and, and the, the, again, the thing I like about you, and this is Mike's last segment, is just like, I try to tell people, depending on where you start in your life, your journey can look a lot uglier than people who maybe started in a more traditional, safe, uh, traditional environment. So. Not the prettiest journey, but a successful one and worthy of a Hall of Fame induction at Virginia Tech. 